Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, this is, I don't know, five or six workshops started doing this actually in mid-March. Uh, today, if you've gotten the email that, we, uh, that I sent out earlier, uh, in this workshop, we're going to be uh, talking about how to make um, 2D furniture. And 2D isn't actually an accurate description. If you're using uh, CNC or other digital tools, uh, this is actually 2.5D uh, furniture. And uh, the example that we're going to make, if you look behind me back, uh, no, this side here, sorry about that, I'm not near uh, this table, there we go. <laughs> This table back here um, is uh, what I'm going to show you how I made that. A little bit of history, I think, is reasonably in order here. Um, this is based upon a class that I've taught several times for four or five years now. And when I uh, work with digital woodworkers, I like to, to do uh, focus on a project itself. And what we're going to do today is kind of crunch down that project into a 45-minute uh, demonstration. And uh, when I work with uh, students in this kind of class, I, I really like them to walk out with something and to build something and machine something. Today, I'm just going to show you how this kind of thing gets developed. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is show you how this got started. Uh, I'm going to do a share screen. I'm going to show you uh, some files of some variations here. Uh, let's go here. Okay. This is uh, an image that uh, most of you probably saw if you're on my mailing list uh, of a series of hall tables. The hall tables here are roughly, and I do say roughly, around 60 inches long and uh, normal hall table height, which is a little extra tall. These are very simple tables. There's no extra stretchers added in this case. They could be added later. So when I do this uh, class, what I've done is I show, I give students the options of building any of these tables. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six tables. But this table here is what we're gonna focus on today. <coughs> Pardon me. So I'm gonna zoom over here and you have a look. Now you can see it's very, very plain. Well, it's plain for a reason. Um, well, hang on in one second. It looks like I may have gotten bumped. Um, return to meeting. Somehow I got bumped out. Hopefully we're still here. Stop. You're still here, Tim. Okay. Well, somehow it signed me up. My apologies. I'll go back to sharing the screen. Okay. Uh, so anyway, it's a very simple table that we have here, and that's deliberate. And the idea of this table is to encourage students to perhaps design their own. To get people started, I actually created multiple variations of this very simple hall table. You can see it's just straight and vertical and everything's straightforward here. And then there's this more mid-century modern version. Uh, then there's this one here. Notice the tops are all unique to each of these. There's another one here that's more like the Memphis style design, these little uh, chunky corners here. Then there's another kind of a modern one over here. And then finally, something a little bit different with these different pillowed edges and stuff. So um, I'm gonna show you what this looks like here in one second. But first, uh, let me show you the example again. I'm gonna end the screen share and uh, bring up another screen here. So um, this is the, uh, the file that I work from. So you can see 60 inches, it's about 32 inches tall. And uh, what I'm going to do is show you how I designed that into something more modern. Go back here one more time. I'm going to bring this up and talk about some of the details. And I'll show you how I created it and give you some ideas on how to take something very basic and make it something a lot more interesting and modern. So I'm going to grab that. Now, nothing here is bolted down. The legs are just stuck on with dominoes. So you can see it's a floating top. These screws here are just for this half scale model that I made up for this class. There are uh, three different uh, supports underneath. They're actually held in with dominoes. In this case, I screw them together so that way I can travel with this and kind of go from there. I'm gonna remove the top and show you how that works. So you can see the top 
just, uh, this is a surfboard style table is what it is. The surfboard style table was actually something started by uh, a table that was designed by, um, I don't think it was the Ameses. I, I think it was one of the other designers at uh, uh, Herman Miller in the 40s and 50s. So you can see there's a little bit of an arch area here. Uh, you can see the little support areas in here. We're not gonna focus on those today. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about the design related to the legs, the stretcher, and of course the top. So um, put this back. So one of the things that people don't have in common is the fact that I suspect that all of us, I do mean all of us, are probably using different software. So myself, I happen to prefer Rhino. Uh, Rhino 3D is a product from a company called McNeil, a little company here in Seattle. It's a very popular program, but I'm sure some of you have some of Autodesk products like Fusion 360 or Aspire or Vectrix or one of the others. For the purpose of this particular uh, discussion we're doing today, I'm focusing again on more on 2D. So probably any CAD software can create or modify what we're doing here. Uh, for the 3D class that I'll do next week, where I'll do a variation of this and show you more elaborate ways to take this, uh, you'll, uh, you'll want to look into uh, 3D software. And again, in this case, I use Rhino. So uh, I'm going to get started right here uh, with another share. Give me one second. Uh, right. Again, I want you to get an idea where I'm starting. So this is a CAD drawing here. I'm going to leave this. I'm going to go to another scene and change my cameras and go to this camera over here. Okay, so you see that's the basic drawing we started from. So in essence, this is the footprint to where I start. Now, um, if you're new to this or you're new to my uh, these events here, I, I need to uh, let you know for sure that uh, my background is design. So I, I've certainly have used all kinds of techniques and different methods in, in design. And I'm gonna show you a couple of things that what I do uh, in this case to show you how this got converted. So I'm gonna go over here and um, let's have a look here. So what I wanna do, instead of having this straight, real squarish kind of thing that goes on here, uh, what I wanna do is have something softer. And I'm gonna just draw roughly an arch across here and a second arch across here. And I'm looking for something like this. Now this is fairly extreme. It just kind of gives you an idea of what I'm up to here. And secondly, the legs are too straight, too vertical. So I'm gonna angle them in a little bit like this and taper them a little bit. Again, this is pretty crude. But to do a better job with that, because this is, a, this is actually a pretty good example of uh, uh, getting out the old drafting tools, you know, I could simply uh, take a French curve and then I'll make a, a decreasing curve here a little bit. It tapers up a little bit toward, toward there. Notice I have only actually drawn to the center. So by drawing to the center, I know that I could simply uh, do what's called a mirror over here and I can make it symmetrical. I'm not really worried about that now. Uh, don't seem to have a ruler on here, but just give you an idea what I'll do with the legs. I'll draw alongside this pad that I have here because I want a little bit of an angle. So effectively, I'm gonna be trying to do that. Now I completed one here so you can kind of see what it's like. So I already have this idea here that I have these curves here and then I have these straight tapered legs here. And at the top, I had drawn, I, I had drawn some uh, curves up here, but in the end I ended up doing is simply a wide oval. Now I'm gonna switch over to, uh, to one of my drawings here uh, to show you what happens in CAD. Now the reason I showed you by the way with sketching is to get, uh, get the idea that, um, uh, let me uh, have one second here. All right, I'm gonna go back to there. See the idea of sketching that way is to get the lines. The lines, when I'm talking about lines, I'm gonna switch back here to my other camera here. And um, give me one second. I'm gonna to have to actually wave my hands here a little bit. So it's one thing 
to sit and actually see these lines come to an end. It's quite another to see where these lines ultimately end up. They actually move this way. So the eye tends to follow the direction of lines. It's not, not just the beginning and the end. It, they tend to extend out. And I'll show you what I did in CAD and how I created it from there. So I'm gonna recreate the same thing in CAD. And again, I'm using Rhino, but that's not too much different than uh, what a lot of you are doing. I'm gonna move back here. So I actually went and, um, great, no idea, there we go. I pulled myself away from my drawing, how about that? Okay, so I've recreated the lines in CAD to show you what I just sketched out. So I had simply drawn these lines full across here using the CAD curve tools. And uh, um, again, all CAD programs will have that. So this gave me an idea where I wanted to end up in terms of this kind of curve, this sort of knocking off about a half inches off, half inch off the top, starting here about here, uh, where the blue line ends up with the same line from the original drawing, tapering up to something here. Now using uh, um, a control point curve, I would actually go in and do the drawing. So I'll go in here, uh, let me turn off my um, snaps here. I'm gonna put a control point there and a control point there. And now I have that curve, I've selected this curve. And because I have this control point, I could simply adjust this curve in any form that I want. So that takes care of that line. Now I'll do the same thing for this curve here and another point here. And you can see that it's a little bit below. So I'm going to take that point that I just drew here and curve it up a little bit till it more or less matches that line. This one here, I'll move up, move down a little, little tiny bit. So that gives you an idea. I'm not being super precise here. So um, I'm gonna turn off my green layer here so you can kind of see what I have, so you can see it off and on. So this is how I went about creating this. So once I got done with that, I flipped it by using what's called a mirror command. And again, all CAD software will have that. And that is the ability to take pretty much anything and flip it over on its side. For example, I'll take these two lines here and I'm gonna actually just type in the command because I know them quicker than finding all of the, uh, the uh, uh, different uh, tools. So I'll flip it over here and you can see I just made a copy over here. The point being is, is you only have to do half the drawing uh, and then you could simply flip it over and make the other half work for you. And this is one of the benefits of CAD is this kind of accuracy and this kind of flexibility. For this, well, it's just really an oval. So I went in and I made, I grabbed the circle tool. Uh, in this case, I probably, let me make sure I have um, center on. I have a center point, where is it at? There we go. Drew an oval and then uh, I simply shrunk down the oval until it, uh, the circle, excuse me, until it became an oval and that's how I created that. So that's kind of the process that I went through to create this. Now to move on a little bit quicker, here is uh, the drawing that's all completed that I just showed you. And this is what I used in order to make that half scale version here a few minutes ago. And I'm gonna go to another drawing so you can kind of see all of these together. So this is the six tables that I had created for the class. This is the rather plain one that I used uh, as an example and encourage students to use as a way to start from and create their own uh, tables. And then this is the one that I just showed you how I created it. You can see the three-dimensional version of that. There's the 2D drawing. These are simply extrusions. I suspect everybody understands what an extrusion is. If you don't, certainly let me know. I'll, we'll find a way to get that explained to you. But these are all variations on a theme. They're all basically the same footprint and that's how that works. So um, first of all, uh, I think an important point is, is even if you use CAD tools, it's still really valuable to sketch and get ideas out. And you saw what I did. I simply sketched out that line, those lines on the top of the curve 
uh, let me point back here, essentially this line across here, this line across here, in order to get a nice flow all the way across the top. That makes it visually much more interesting. And that curve back there, that really matches up really well with the curved top that I, that I built there. So if there's questions, by the way, uh, certainly put them up uh, into the chat window. So I'm gonna move along from here and show you how that got machined or these full-size tables get machined. All right, let me go over here, share screen. I think this is the one, um, got lots of files here. Let's find out here that this is, yes, this is the right file. So um, I'm gonna move to a perspective view. So what I had done is, uh, as I mentioned, is I extruded out this oval here. Extruded in terms, I made it thick in three-dimensional form. Now, this simple kind of CAD work, it is not necessary to actually do 3D models. If you're only gonna cut depth, essentially cut through a board around the outside or the inside or whatever it is, you actually only need a 2D drawing. That's all you need which is really helpful. So on these simple kinds of projects, I tend to use the three-dimensional models as simply references. It gives me an idea what it's gonna look like. I can get down low and see all the details and kind of go from there. So, um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, what I'll do now is show you how I set up the CAD, or excuse me, the CAM part of, the, of this project. Let me get back out of this. And uh, I'm gonna share one more time and I'm gonna set up, uh, show you how the CNC machine is set up from the beginning. Now, again, everybody's gonna have a slightly different variation of this, but uh, in the end, it's really going to be the same uh, for everybody. Uh, let's, um, sorry to keep talking to myself. I've got lots of screen options here. Um, no, that's not it, excuse me. I guess this one is it. Nope, I went back to the same one. Apology for that. Make sure I have the right file open. There it is. All right. And this is the file. So I prepared this. <coughs> Let me uh, expand this out a little bit. Okay, those are the parts that we uh, that I need to make. Essentially, you have the stretcher here, you have uh, four legs that you'll need in the end, you have a top, and then uh, that's a, a separate file with, with the stretcher. These dots, by the way, here simply represent positions for what, in the case of this particular project, are domino holes. CNC is a perfect thing to use to cut in some sort of flat object to do domino holes. A domino is a wonderful tool for cutting out a, a, a joint, but if you don't have a reference point to butt up to, or if you have to use a domino and press from the top, it's awfully hard to get things lined up. CNC domino holes are really simple. So if you look over here, I've laid out these boards and essentially there's a pair of legs. Uh, there's the top, there's a pair of stretchers. Now, how I did this, of course, is I did one of these legs and then I mirrored it and flipped it and made a copy down here. Now, in order to set up the CNC uh, uh, routines that you need for this, the machine operations, essentially uh, this takes just one kind of operation and that operation is generically referred to uh, as a profile cut uh, or it could be a contour cut depending on your software name. Now, the way Rhino works, this is Rhino Cam, by the way, which is a plugin that goes into Rhino. Some of you, again, you may have Fusion 360, you may have Aspire, you may have Vectrix or whatever. Uh, this may look foreign to you, but I guarantee you the information that I'm going to put in is gonna be the same. So um, I'm gonna simply set up to cut these two legs. My first thing I have to do is identify what I am cutting. Now notice that my origin point is in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, for me, I'm used to that because I prefer my CNC's long axis 
to be along this direction here, the x-axis, short axis this way. Depending on your CNC, it may be inverted 90 degrees or flipped around or something else. But I find this uh, really useful. So I'm going to select these two curves. And I'll go here and select curve regions. Now I'm just identifying what it is uh, that I'm going to be machining. So I'm going to save that for now. Um, well, actually, I, I need to select a tool. I'm going to make a modification in a minute. I usually do it before. So now I need to select the tool that is going to make the cut here. Um, I'm going to keep this pretty simple. I'm going to create a new tool. I'm going to, uh, I'm not using my tool library. I'm doing this from scratch. I'm going to use a flat mill, which is obviously flat on the bottom. And I'm going to uh, make it, uh, this is, is this a tapered mill? Uh, no, let me make sure I got this right. Yeah, tapered mill. And I'm going to, um, the flute, uh, flute diameter, I'm going to make it, well, I'm just going to leave it at 0.5 just to keep things simple here. I'm going to simply identify this as a half inch mill and uh, kind of go along with this that I have already set up. So uh, I'm going to make these cuts with a half inch mill. And I'm going to save this first because there's something I forgot to do first. I'm going to go back to the perspective view of this here. Now notice that everything is down on the Z0 surface. Now uh, in previous talks, one of the things that I brought up is, is when I'm doing woodworking, when I'm actually cutting wood, I prefer to actually use my Z off of the bottom of the part that I'm cutting, not the top. And there's a couple of reasons for it, but the most critical reason is I don't want to cut through uh, my spoil board or the surface of the CNC that I'm using. And this has been one of the best things that I have found to keep that from happening. In order to do that properly, that means I have to have my curves or my lines that I'm cutting moved up to the thickness of the wood. I'm going to assume right now that uh, the thickness of the wood is inch and a half. So um, uh, let me get over to this. I'm going to go in here. And of course, something wouldn't be up here when I was ready for it. I'm going to uh, use a, a tool in Rhino called uh, Box Edit, but other programs have this. I move these two up to uh, position here. I'm going to say that it's 1.5 inches high uh, off the ground. So I've actually, um, one of those days here, guys, 1.5 and apply. So you can see from the side here, I've raised it up. And I would certainly do the rest with the rest of this here. Now, one and a half inch thickness is pretty high, a pretty thick wood. But later on in the next class, I'll show you why it's one and a half inches high, because that gives me room to 3D carve these legs. But for now, we're just going to stick with 2D. So think about what I've done so far. I've selected what I'm going to machine. I've determined that I'm going to cut it, in this case, with a half inch mill. And uh, I, now I need to determine some other factors. And again, you'll find this with whatever kind of CAM software that you're using. So I'm going to go back into this routine here and finish out what I'm doing. So right here, there's the half inch tool, diameter is half inch tool. And feeds and speeds we'll get to later. Cut parameters, one of the most important things is I'm going to say that, um, expand this a little bit. I want to cut on the outside of the curve. Now, this is something everybody will mess up at least once in their career or whenever they're using a CNC. I want to cut around the outside of this. I could just as easily go around the inside. So I have selected outside. So I'll save that. And uh, I'm going to go in here. And next parameter is, is going to be, uh, I consider this an important one. Now, RhinoCam is a pretty advanced program. It allows you to do lots of interesting things. It's mostly sold to high-end machine shops that do a lot of mold making and, and other things for manufacturing. So there's a lot of, of ways that are, things are done to where uh, it's expecting metal. So for example, if you look down here, there's an assumption that you would uh, either engage into the cut from the outside and then 
then follow along the path that you've told the tool to do. But I found very few times that that's really useful in terms of woodworking. So I know that I want to go along the path. So you can see that when the cut starts, it's actually going to come right along the path. And I'm going to do the same thing in terms of the exit. Now, uh, other cut parameters here, I always set my tolerances pretty high to a thousandth of an inch. Now, feeds and speeds, um, well, it depends on the wood that you're using. Uh, I'm going to say uh, that I'm going to cut this at, uh, at uh, say, uh, 80 uh, inches per minute. Uh, the rest of this has to do with the speeds of different movements, plunging down into the cut, the approach as it starts to slope down, and the engagement when that starts. I'll leave those alone for now, but generally I set all of these for 50 because I find that's fast enough, and, and all my processes go just as fast this way. Now, depending on the wood, I might cut this at a cutting speed of, say, 120, sometimes more. Now, um, I got cut levels. Okay, uh, the, uh, the geometry that's going to control the cut is at the top to cut. Remember, I moved everything up and then the, uh, the curves that are going to be along the top. Now, I'm not going to make the full depth cut. Now, I know that in the end, I have to cut, uh, say, 1.5 inches deep. That is a whole lot of cut, uh, and you'll find that you'll break bits, jam the machine, have all kinds of, all kinds of problems. I'm going to actually cut it at 0.25 inches per pass, and I'm going to make each pass 0.25 inches. And again, this will be the same, you know, for every, um, you know, every uh, different types of software that you're using. So with all that, I'm going to generate my tool paths. As you can see here, the blue lines represent the tool paths. The machine will go around here. So you can see down below here. So there's my uh, geometry on the top. It's cutting through a block of material here. And end up there, I could show that on a simulation. And uh, so what I'll do is I'm going to quickly simulate uh, bring this up. I'm going to not do it by moves. I'll slow it down a little bit. Simulations are hypercritical for CNC woodworking or any kind of stuff. You need to know exactly what the tool is doing when it's cutting beforehand. You don't want to find out what happens when you don't do that correctly. And I'll start the simulation process. So it's working its way through one of those boards, then moving off to the other. And finishing up the last layer, now it's working on the next object, working its way down. The light blue or the aqua color here is representing straight lines. The dark blue is the curves and all the rest of that. Now, for those of you that have done CNC machining already, you know that once this cuts through, those parts are going to rattle loose. So there's a couple of possibilities of what you can do. First thing is to hold those parts in place by putting in what's either called a tab or a bridge, depending on the software. I'm going to show you that. So I'll go back into my setup. And I'll go to advanced parameters here. And I'm going to say that I want to put in rectangular tabs, which means these little tiny pieces of wood that I'm going to leave at, until the end. Uh, the height, I usually make them, this is pretty common for me, uh, an eighth of an inch tall, sometimes a quarter inch tall. I like to make them fairly substantial in length, like about a half inch. Wood is fairly dense, and you get a whole lot of stuff going on in terms of mass and movement and all the rest of that. So I'm going to say that I want to do four of these. Now, if you look along here on the simulation here, you could see right here, that little square. So you're going to get a little hop right at the end here. So you can see another one on the other side of the board here. Um, there's probably some left in the awkward parts of the board here. But essentially, there's four of those there. That will hold the wood in place. And then when you get done, you could walk over and either go off to a bandsaw or what I like to do, I like to use those oscillating tools to break those free. I'm going to show you another alternative. And I do this probably more often than this. And I simply don't cut all the way through the board. If I know I'm going to make a cut and it's a valuable piece of wood, what I do is I simply leave a little extra room at the bottom. So again, cut levels. Instead of cutting it all the way through to 1.5, I'm going to cut it and leave 
uh, an eighth of an inch on the bottom. And that way it's not all the way through. And why an eighth of an inch? You'll, um, let's see here, get rid of that. I'm gonna actually turn off my bridges and tabs. And uh, now what happens, I didn't, oh, I didn't save that, my apologies. Go back in there. Uh, cut levels, 1.375, rough depth. Yeah, there we go. That's what happens when you don't pay attention. Okay, so you can see that I'm sitting up above uh, the uh, Z level here. So why an eighth of an inch? Well, first of all, unless it's a very dense piece of wood, there are times that I will leave a quarter inch, but unless it's a very dense piece of wood, um, unless it's a very dense piece of wood, I have found that leaving an eighth inch of bottom will stabilize the board. The second thing is, is I'm a woodworker, I've got a bandsaw, I've got no trouble at all walking over to a bandsaw and rough cutting out that piece of wood, leaving a little bit of jagged edge. And I could go over and either use a trim router with a flush trim bit or what is pretty likely anyway, I'm likely to be rounding over some of these corners anyway. I'll go over with an eighth inch rod over pit and I will ultimately flush trim that and put it around over at the same time. It's, it's a routine that I do again and again. Uh, I've shown in other workshops how to do it with what's called onion skinning, a very thin layer. And uh, that's another way to do it. So you've got onion skinning, you've got leaving some at the bottom, you've got uh, tabs and, and then all the rest from there. I'm gonna go back into uh, CAD here for a second. Um, okay. So uh, this drawing here, well, this is just a capture here. So this in essence is the drawing that I ended up with. And um, let's see here, there we go. Now, uh, what I'll talk about next week, I just wanna give you a little preview is how to take it another step farther how to make this into a 3D, um, a 3D model. And I'm gonna show you a couple of tricks that are easy to do. And I've done enough research to find out that there is a lot, definitely a lot of software that will do some of these tricks that I like to do. There's, um, the thing is, is if you've got a CNC and you're building furniture in particular, and you're only thinking about flat, you're missing the boat, you're missing the power of these machines. There's no question about it. You can do a whole lot. I'm gonna show you another um, example I got back here. So this top was, uh, I had a bad board here and I use this as an example. This is full size top of what you just saw, but you could see, you could see that it's tapered along here, but it's actually a little more sophisticated than that. If you, it's hard to see the line here, but there's actually a straight line along the outside edge that tapers down to the ends, but it's all tied in with this rounded over area here. Show you a little better picture here. Okay, those are things we're gonna talk about next week. Let me get back to that. All right. Okay, so in this uh, example here, let me go back up to here. So here is one of these being cut. This was actually one of my students that did this uh, a couple of years ago named Bjorn Reddick. And uh, his top is all cut out here. So you can see he had actually done this as a tapered piece all the way around very even. And um, let's see here, next, next image. See it from the end. You can see that he left pretty much uh, like I specified about an eighth of an inch at the bottom and you'd see the little taper. He tape, he'd actually glued together two boards to pull this off right through the center. And here it is rough cut. We're gonna go through this next week. And there's his leg and he'd use a 3D technique that I taught him on how to do this. Worked out really well. I'll show you how to do that next week. Turned out very nice. He created all this during class. Works out good. This is a different student, Tim Cooper. Uh, this is uh, when I had taught this with a straight top. I thought it was a little strange when he walked in with pieces of cherry and walnut, but it turned out really good. Glued it together, true surfboard. Way to go, Tim. Good work on that. Now, 
uh, one of the things I promised to show you uh, is how to do some of this kind of work on a small CNC. Now, some of you might be aware of it, but I'll, I'll show you just how some of this actually gets done. Um, let's see, make sure I get the right file. I got too many files open, that's for sure. Um, one second workshop, I think this is it. Yes, okay. So here's a couple of approaches. I mentioned before the value, the incredible value of having a, a board at the bottom of your CNC, your CNC bed that is machined by the CNC itself and it is registrable. In order to do that, you have to use the CNC itself to make these registration points, these fine points. So essentially there's multiple steps. So machine operation one, I'm gonna move down here, kind of see what goes on. So here it is set up on a 16 by 32, which is the smaller the shape Oco XL. Uh, and you can see how it's set up to go through. So the excess board area has actually been milled with half inch holes in this case, I just happened to use that. I extended these out here to show what happens, but they actually register into the board itself, you know, the, the spoil board. So that you can move these along. Here's the next operation here and do half at a time. The Shape Oco uh, XL is 32 in the short, uh, in the uh, 32 inches uh, where the gantry passes over and only 16 inches in depth. Now, if you had a Shape Oco XXL, well, you could probably do these legs on one pass, but it gives you an idea. So how do you do it from there? Well, essentially you split your drawing. You make duplicates of your drawing. I put this, um, this surface in here to give you an idea right here. So what happens here is half of it gets cut, but you actually exceed past this line where you make the cut. In my case, I'd set it up, I think for an inch on each side. So first half, you go an inch beyond where your actual line of, in essence, of cutoff is. In other words, you've continued back up here a little longer than where that cut would be. Then when you make the second move, you do this half here. So in the end, you have machined the areas right here and right here twice. You'll find it a lot easier to get in there with a little bit of sandpaper and to blend them. Uh, next example. Okay, let's say you have a 24 by 24 CNC bed. Not too much of a problem, but you're gonna have to make several steps. Now this top here is 60 inches long. So here it is in the first section, here it is in the middle section, here it is in the third operation over here. And that's how you move things through. But to do that, you need to have some reference point on the CNC to register from, and then put similar registration points uh, or similar positions, you machine them into the board itself. So before you even start to cut this here, the first thing I'm going to cut is all of these holes. So I have a way to register them and hold them and, and uh, position the boards in the back. So um, before I forget, and I did forget, I want to bring up a couple of things. Uh, one of them is, is uh, I'm not sure if it's worked. Uh, I did set it up, but uh, we'll, we'll find out. I'm not sure, no, it doesn't look like it worked. Sorry about that. Uh, in terms of, um, I'm setting this up uh, from now to be able to work on YouTube. So th this will be a YouTube stream. I don't think it worked today, but I'll work on my settings for that. So um, again, next week we're gonna do a 3D workshop. Uh, the other thing is, is I'm going to no longer be, at least for the time being, being doing workshops every two weeks. And the reason is, well, at least where I live, things have started, the lockdown has started to ease up a little bit. In fact, look at this. On Thursday, I got a haircut. I mean, this is, this is shocking. This is great. I finally got a haircut. So uh, people's time are going to be consumed with other activities and, and maybe getting out and enjoying the summer a little bit. So I'm going to do the workshops only once a month uh, starting in July. Uh, it'll be a consistent date. I'm not sure what it is. It'll likely be a Sunday again. Uh, I'm waiting for input. If somebody says it should be on Saturday, maybe we can work that out. Uh, but it'll be, you know, like the second Saturday or Sunday of the month or something like that. Uh, the next thing is um, this workshop here is actually a really good example. As I mentioned, I've taught this class several times. 
I'm going to offer to teach this remotely to uh, groups of four or five students at best in a series of workshops. And what'll happen is, is we're gonna have four or five uh, weekly events to where we'll get together, four or five of us together, in a four or five of these hour long, minimum of hour long events. We're gonna go over the project and you're gonna show what you've done in the past. I'm gonna answer your questions and help you through problems. And then also uh, you'll get a half hour of my time, one-on-one -on -one, you know, uh, with video cameras and, and all that. We'll be able to look at each other's shop and I can help you with something on your own. And then that'll all start off with a 10 minute interview of each student so I can find out their capabilities, the tools and all the rest of that. So I'm gonna give this a try. Uh, what I'm gonna do is charge $300 for it for four or five students. You'll actually end up building one of these full size, not this half size little thing back here, but full size. And um, you have the option of either building uh, with my files if you're more comfortable or creating your own that is up to you. And anyway, so that, that's, gonna, that's an option. If you're interested, uh, send me mail at tim at woodworking.digital. I'll do a mailing about this as well. Uh, as to when, well, let's see if we can get four or five students together and kind of go from there. Um, I'm gonna look over here to questions. Says I'm using a Shapeo, Shapeoko XL and Aspire, which has the ability to tile. Tile, yeah, that's, that's the term usually uh, used in graphic design and it does work, but you still gotta register your part and you need to register your bid. You can't move things, kinda sorta. They need to be pin registered uh, in some way. Uh, says, any reason why you don't screw the part to hold it in place instead? Okay, well that's holding the part. There's nothing wrong with that. You can hold the part, you can use clamps and all the rest of it. That holds the part, but to get it into a position to where you have to move it and get it into the second position requires perfect accuracy in terms of alignment and pin registration and, and from there. So I'm gonna open up, uh, we're about 45 minutes or close to 45 minutes. And uh, if people have questions, um, let me see if I have a few more images while you guys work on your questions. I think I maybe do have some other screens to share. Let's find out here. There's that. Oh yeah, well, here's some, uh, half scale versions that I make when I teach. I often do these because they're easier to haul around and to demo. That's one of the other designs I showed you. That's a, yet another one and another one. So um, yeah, so um, okay. So anyway, uh, one of the things you will get if you decide to take this class is you will end up with the files to make these uh, yourself. And there'll be DXF files or Rhino files, depending on what you use. You can kind of go from there. So uh, open up for a few last minute questions. No questions, really? Okay, well, uh, well, I see one of my students in there, Jerry Alonzo, you and I have worked together on classes before. Oh, file management naming. Oh yeah, the holy grail. Well, uh, as I mentioned in the past, my background's graphic design. I was super early in terms of using computers and using design tools and all the rest of that. And I've been a, uh, going through a lot over the years with different techniques and file naming and all the rest of that. I will tell you that the world of CAD and CAM and G-code files has made everything I learned in the past, well, it's just 10 times more complicated because you have to manage these files generally. I'd start off with the idea that you say you have a folder or a directory, whatever you want to call it, that is the name of the project. And then inside there is an equally referenced uh, file name to the project. In other words, uh, you know, what this is in this case, it's a, it's a uh, sofa table, so you can sofa table. And then uh, I, this is just me, when I go through iterations of designs, I usually go, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and I put the word dev after it. This is again, just me. So I may go through five, six, seven, whatever eight, uh, stages of development. Once I'm right close to being final, then I start to name them either final or whatever. And then when the file is completely ready, I start to call the files with extension, not extensions, but you know, last part, I call them production. And then uh, when I'm actually milling, I'm using file names with a name mill on it. And, uh, and sometimes, uh, for example, I keep looking at this 
There we go. Uh, in this case, you're going to have stretchers, you're going to have legs, you're going to have top, you're going to have the short stretchers. So I have to have something reference in there. So that could be uh, sofa table one, short stretch, long stretch, legs, top. Those become the distinct things. And from there, you got your G-code namings as well. But I want those G-code names to be tightly associated with the files that create them. Anyway, that's, you know, that's kind of how I do it. Okay, let's see. Um, apologize for not being clear, but I meant using screws to hold it after being cut. Also, any comments on Rhino versus Aspire versus Fusion where the price keeps going up? Well, let's start with that first part. I meant using screws to hold it after being cut. So you mean to assemble this? You might get back to me on that. I would not use screws if that is your thought. I would definitely not use screws. Um, been a furniture maker for a long time. I use screws to do certain kinds of things that don't take any load or have any structural uh, problems. Um, but uh, screws are, well, let's put it this way. Screws do not expand and contract wood joints if it's made out of the same material or close to the same material, uh, uh, they all will expand and contract together. And with modern glues and modern joinery, you'll find that everything moves and contracts and expands depending on humidity and temperature together. And then uh, you'll find that uh, things stay together more. But screws are basically not, not a very good tool in woodworking. Uh, let's see your seven, second part here. Uh, any comments, Rhino versus Aspire versus Fusion 360, where the price keeps going up? I'm not familiar. Is, is Fusion gone up? I think they've still been offering uh, more or less a free version to people that keep their, their income as low or it's not a big profession. I'm not sure how that goes. So it may be uh, you know, un, unclear about that. I can tell you that there is a big difference between Fusion 360 and Aspire and Rhino. Now, um, Fusion 360 is not really geared toward three-dimensional modeling. Uh, Autodesk has better tools for that. Their top of the line uh, tool, which is, um, I don't know why I'm forgetting it all of a sudden. It's a really powerful tool, does a lot of stuff. Fusion 360 is a little more focused on pretty straightforward uh, two-dimensional plus some three-dimensional modeling. Uh, the CAM part of it, which is the machining aspect, setting up the machining uh, is, uh, fairly minimal, but for most woodworkers, it will, will get you there. Uh, in terms of Aspire and Rhino, those are a little better comparison. Part of it is their price ranges are somewhat in a similar price range. You can, Rhino, I think, lists for a thousand, but I think you can, you can find it for $700 if you look around. Excuse me one second. <coughs> they have similar capabilities. You have 3D, uh, Aspire is 3D as well, but it also includes the CAM part, so there's some value there. Uh, in terms of how their interface works, I personally find that extremely important. And it's one of the reasons that I use Rhino. Rhino's interface is fantastic. It lets you create on the fly. If you're using Fusion 360, for example, it's built upon a solids model. It's basically like SolidWorks uh, to where you have a hierarchical tree that you need to create in order to really control things. There are some benefits to that for sure, absolutely. But there are some downsides as well. Uh, for example, there are a lot of real high-end uh, SolidWork jockeys that they create their models in Rhino, then they move them over to SolidWorks because they can create faster and improvise and finesse things and stuff in Rhino. They get into uh, SolidWorks and they use the benefits and definitely there are benefits in SolidWorks. Excuse me. <coughs> Need another cough drop. My throat's a little dry. Uh, so, um, but one of the things that Aspire does that I personally don't like is it decides to create it decides to create a whole different kinds of metaphors and other CAD programs. But that will get you there. That will take you as far as you need to go, as far as you could possibly go as a woodworker. They'll do that. And for most woodworkers, uh, Fusion will as well. So, so uh, when profiling part of the piece, how do you keep it from cutting all the sides of the workpiece and cutting the table in half? Oh, um, Cutting the table in half. Um, maybe this refers to this caterpillar motion of moving through. You simply, what you do is you say you want to cut the lines on the outside, but not the full contained outside area. So you would just, if this was a, a leg like this, you would just cut three sides. You wouldn't cut four sides. That how you keep it from coming apart. I'm not sure about cutting the table in half. I think that's what you meant. Uh, there's also specific routines 
uh, for doing that in some CAM software, but I know you could do that just with standard profiling or contouring. Okay, somebody said, I started and researched the Xerox and all my files start with the year, month, date, project name, et cetera. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. But remember, you get free year, month, and date anyway, free uh, year, month, and date anyway, just by looking at the file attributes or listing somewhere else. Uh, everybody has a different way to work at it. If your hobbyist fusion gives you one year free that can be renewed, again, that's an important point for a lot of hobbyists. But, and I've said this so many times, your time is more valuable than any free software. If you got where you needed to go and it's worth spending $700 and extrapolating that over 20 years, because Rhino does not increase their prices, they don't charge you an annual fee, then maybe that's $700 or $1,000 for Aspire or whatever. Maybe that it's really a bargain. I think your time is really valuable. CAD software, no matter what kind of CAD software you use, takes a huge amount of time and a lot of effort to learn. Uh, you'll put in a couple, three years to get you know, really comfortable with it. But boy, after 20 years, you're gonna really have it down and put a lot of work into it. At that point, whatever the CAD software costs you is gonna be irrelevant. It's ultimately about your time. So uh, let's see, are there any other questions? No, I don't think so. We're a little bit over the time that we have. So um, anyway, um, if you're interested in a class, email me at tim at woodworking.digital. Again, I'm gonna charge $300. It'll take place over probably four weeks. I suspect there'll be at least four, maybe five sessions over four weeks. We'll figure that out. It'll likely be on a weekend when you have time. Sessions will be a minimum of an hour. There'll be a personal session of a half hour with each student, uh, plus an interview, you know, a 10 minute phone interview so we can kind of get to know each other a little bit. And of course you're gonna be able to email me and do all the rest of that. In each of those sessions, by the way, we'll start with kind of a review of the previous work, you know, the previous week's work. We can kind of go over things, see what one student had done here, another student had done and all that. So it's useful in a sense as a team sport, if, as, it, as it were. And uh, anyway, so that's available, $300. I'm not sure when I do it, maybe August if there's enough interest. Uh, next week, we're gonna do 3D. Let me show you a little thing on that. This was a test piece. I use thin wood, so the joints will show. So look along here. So I have a taper on the inside to a narrow flat part here, then around over here, then around over here, and then this bevel. So now I've accentuated the lines, you know, this nice little shadow line and all the rest of that. So that's how, what I'm gonna show you how to do using an incredibly simple technique. And it's a technique that any digital woodworker really should know and put to work. So if you're interested in this and some other stuff along this lines, definitely come back next week. Uh, look forward to it. Um, I'm using techniques like that. I'm building a large major piece of sculpture for a client. My wife's actually designed the piece. For example, this is a 3D model, printed model. This would be a really large piece. All kinds of tapers and shapes and stuff going on in here using these same techniques. I use this and other techniques all the time. I also apply patterns and all kinds of textures and things. We're gonna get started on that anyway next week. So somebody said they vote for keeping classes on Sunday. Saturday is too full as it is. Well, that was kind of my thinking in the beginning. Uh, I do appreciate everybody's uh, interest and thank you for your patience and hanging in there and all the rest of that. Again, next week's the class. Sometime in July, probably mid-July, we'll do another Sunday class. And uh, if you got any ideas of some things that you'd like covered, don't be shy. Go ahead and email me. Let me know. Again, it's Tim at woodworking.digital. Uh, there will be a video of this uh, available in a couple of days. I didn't see that the YouTube video went up. Uh, we'll get that straightened out, but it'll be up on YouTube. That's where I'm putting the videos at this point. So thank you, everybody, and I appreciate it. And, well, that's it. We'll see you, ben. See you again next week. Bye. Thanks, Tim. Thank you.